Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Can lead them astray, and whom he leaves astray, no one can lead them back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no other deity but Allah by himself, no associate to him. And I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad is his servant and messenger. O oh, you who believed, fear Allah as he should be feared and die not except as Muslims. O oh, you who believed, fear Allah and always say a word directed to the truth, that he may make your conduct whole and sound and forgive you your sins. He that obeys Allah and his messenger has then attained the highest achievement. So starting off the khutbah with a beautiful verse from the Holy Quran, surely there is a good example for you in the messenger of Allah, for all those who look forward to Allah in the last day and remember Allah much. Today, let's talk about chores and let's explore the concept of chores from an Islamic perspective. We will inshallah talk about why chores are not really chores if they're managed properly and also how Islam helps us turn the mundane into the sacred, and we will explore some diverse perspectives related to this. A chore is defined as a tedious but necessary task. Think of that sink full of dishes. It is usually thought of as a household task. The word does not usually have the most positive image in our mind, but when we stop to think about these daily tasks that make our life orderly and beautiful, that make our homes pleasant, functional, and welcoming, I wonder if we should discard the word chore for something more respectful. Words have power, and words help define how we feel about something. Maybe we should call them daily small sadaqas, since that is what they really are. Islam is a beautiful religion that elevates every single part of our life. All of the tasks that we do to maintain our health and well-being and to contribute to our family are holy tasks that are appreciated by and rewarded by Allah. We may have all heard of the reports about how the Blessed Prophet Muhammad spent time in his homes. I was reminded of this after listening to Chaplain Usama's excellent lessons on the Shamail. So I will recite some of the reports here. When Hazrat Aisha was asked, what did the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, do in his house? She said, the Prophet would do chores for his family, and he would go out when it was time for prayer. And other hadiths add that he would be at the service of his family, he would milk his sheep, patch his garments, serve himself, and mend his shoes. And another report adds that he would, he was a human like any other, like he would just do normal things in his house. And so... Often we quickly read this and we move past this to other parts of the sunnah without reflecting much. But today let's take the opportunity to really re reflect on this aspect of the blessed prophet's life because it impacts our life in a huge way. Imagine this most important and sacred of humans, the best of humanity, the leader of a community, wearing so many hats, it's almost hard to count them supporting various widows through marriage, guiding countless companions. And he's coming to his own homes, not as a king to be served, but as a useful and productive member of the household, contributing to the essential tasks that keep our lives healthy, happy, and organized. By holding this noble example in our mind, I hope we can all think of these household duties as the vital parts of our day that they are. They are the small stitches that hold together the fabric of our life. They are like the pegs that hold down a tent. Let's go in a little more detail now and think about the emphasis on in Islam on cleanliness. The Quran exhorts external and external purity through regular washing before prayers and bathing. And the Blessed Prophet said that cleanliness is half of our faith. That's a lot, half. Much of our bemoaned chores are cleaning related and they are based, I mean, the, the purpose is to maintain our health and well-being. And if we think a little bit more about cleaning, what I have figured out is that much of the complexity that I face in my life related to cleaning or maintaining my house comes from my excessive possessions. 
And our blessed prophet used to live a life of great simplicity, which we may also call minimalism in modern times. He had what was necessary for his life, nothing more. Hence, he was able to keep his possessions in order without spending half a day cleaning out a closet or digging through piles of shoes, as we may be doing. It is hard to clean if our surroundings are greatly cluttered and messy. And so learning good organization skills and also limiting our possessions helps us keep our daily maintenance tasks manageable. In other words, purify intentions and then simplify and simplify and simplify our lives. Another area of these so-called chores are grocery shopping and cooking. And we are so blessed that while it's Islam exhorts us to feed our neighbors and the less fortunate and great emphasis is laid on this, this beautiful and practical religion also reminds us that charity begins at home and feeding our family is a charity. Imagine a time when you were tired and hungry and someone put a healthy, delicious home-cooked meal in front of you. And think of the gratitude that you felt at that moment and the connection you felt with the person who cooked that meal. Recently, I found this thought expressed in a cookbook in which the author said that cooking for others and seeing them enjoying what she made filled her and nourished her with a joy that kept her going. That said, if the burden of cooking is only on one person and others are just making demands and picking fault with what is being cooked, cooking can seem like an overwhelming and thankless chore. As always, we can return to the blessed sunnah of shared housework, shared responsibility as a way to maintain the health and well-being of everyone. And in our foodie culture, it, has, it helps us to remember that the Blessed Prophet ate really simple fare. Eating healthy does not have to be complicated. He never found fault with his food and he would also not overeat. So his emphasis was on sharing and giving away. And if we think about it, much domestic peace is to be found in this simplicity. I always like to find guidance and similarities in other faiths as well. So I read in Quartz magazine about a Japanese Zen Buddhist monk, Matsumoto, who says that tidying spaces is a great way to create order at work and at home and in your head. And he wrote a best-selling book about it called A Monk's Guide to a Clean House and Mind. And he advises cleaning as a road to illumination, both alone and in groups. He says scrubbing is an inexpensive and utilitarian form of therapy, plus a contemplative practice. Tidying with friends, family, and even strangers can help us achieve inner and outer peace. He believes and says, clean the lamps and fixtures gently as if you are polishing your heart and soul to make them shine their brightest. So this monk is a member of the Kamyoji Temple in Tokyo, and twice a month he invites people to join him as part of the temple's cleanup crew. And the gathering draws a diverse crowd so that even the CEO of, of Tokyo Stock Exchange listed company once showed up with his workers for a contemplative scrub session. After the sweeping, the cleaners have tea and chat. For Matsumoto, the act of cleaning is much more than a chore. It's a spiritual practice that can unite people and ensures psychological health. He writes, we sweep dust to remove our worldly desires. We scrub dirt to free ourselves of attachments. We live simply and take time to contemplate the self, mindfully living each moment. It's not just monks who need to live this way. Everyone in today's busy world needs to do it. And we find similar guidance about the spiritual aspects of cleaning and tidying in Islam. Now let's talk about who is doing most of these chores or daily sadhakas, however you want to call them. According to Pew Research, a majority of women, 59% say that they do more household chores than their spouse or partner, while 6% say that their spouse or partner does more. The sad thing is not only that women bear an unfair load, while many are also working outside the house and they're doing the lion's share of childbearing and raising. It is also sad when vital household duties are denigrated as women's work or something that we should just get someone else to do for us. Why should we have to do it for ourselves? As if it were beneath us. Because doing our own work helps foster humility within us and not doing it kind of tends us to lead us toward arrogance. 
I also wonder how many brilliant women never reached their full potential because they were buried beneath a mountain of housework that they were left alone to tackle. It also reminds me of one of my favorite quotes by the writer Irma Bombeck. Housework, if you do it right, can kill you, she said. She probably had no one pitching in to help her. We can counter that with thinking or saying, housework, if done the Sunnah way, can uplift everyone. And children are uplifted, as the research shows, according to the Center for Parenting Education. Research indicates that those children who do have a set of chores have higher self-esteem, they're more responsible, and they are better able to deal with frustration and delayed gratification, all of which contribute to greater success in school. Furthermore, research by Marty Rossman shows that involving children in household tasks at an early age can have a positive impact later in life. In fact, she says that the best predictor of young adult success in their mid twenties was, was that they participated in household tasks when they were three or four. So that is very young. That involves a lot of patience on the part of the parents involving a child that young, but it really helps them and gets it into their mind, I think, that you are an active and positive member of this household. You're not just a consumer, you are a producer. Another interesting angle on these small daily sadhakas is that household duties provide a welcome break for our overstimulated brains, as new research by the Academy of Management shows. They say that taking on a bland routine task allows your brain to go into autopilot, where it doesn't have to think consciously. And this means that your subconscious will be more likely to come into play. If you have just been engaging in a creative activity such as writing or working <coughs> at your job, your brain will still be subconsciously going over this even once you have stopped. And keeping your mind empty with a boring task means the ideas it generates will have the space to spring forward into your conscious mind. May Allah help us all to see the beauty and meditative value in our daily tasks. I will conclude my khutbah in the second half. I say this saying of mine and I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of Muslims. And so ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver and the merciful. In the name of Allah and exaltations be to Allah and blessings and peace be upon the Messenger of Allah. The Blessed Prophet said that the best good deeds are those which are done constantly and regularly, even though they are small. So this is basically the definition of our chores or small daily sadhakas. If we think about it, we have an inborn desire for us to want to live meaningful lives and to feel that what we do each day has a positive impact on the world around us. And while we work to fulfill this desire on a larger scale, an easy way to have an impact is to create heaven in our homes by beautifying our homes with our presence, by leaving each space better than we found it. A small example from my life is that my husband worked from home and I teach in person, and he knows that I hate dishes piled up in the sink. So no matter how busy he is, I have noticed that whenever I come home, he took the time to load the dishwasher. And so I don't walk into an overflowing sink. This simple act of caring means more to me than any expensive gift that he could give me. I'm sure that everyone has similar examples in their own family of what you do for each other. And I hope that what we do is we talk more about the value of these small sadhakas and how important they are to us how these small gestures are more important than big extravagant gestures. If you are someone who leaves the bathroom and kitchen clean after you use it, know that that is very impactful. You are reducing the stress in your home. You are making your home a better place and the world a better place. This is not women's work. This is everyone's work. In closing, there is nothing that doesn't become sacred if it is for the sake of Allah, if we are intentional about doing it. And Allah wants us to serve humanity. And the most deserving of humanity is our own family. All our daily work becomes sacred. All of it becomes rewarded when we have a good intention and we're doing something with caring and love. 
May Allah help us all to use mindfulness and gratitude to transform our daily chores into daily small sadaqahs and to perform them with reverence and with joy. Servants of Allah, Allah commands justice, the doing of good and liberality to kith and kin. He forbids all shameful deeds and injustice and rebellion. He instructs you that you may remember. Remember Allah the Supreme in glory and he will remember you and be thankful to him and he will increase you in bounty and seek his forgiveness. He will forgive you and have taqwa of him. He will make for you a way out of your issues. That brings my khutbah to a close. Jazakallah for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.